And I call on Michael Russell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, on Tuesday I came to this chamber to make a statement about why the Scottish Ministers considered it necessary now to introduce the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill, despite the continuing passage at Westminster of a bill with similar intent. Yesterday, the Lord Advocate came to this chamber to make, for the first time, a statement on the senior law officers' reasons for respectfully considering a bill to be within the legislative competence of this Parliament, despite a presiding officer deciding not to grant it a positive certificate. And today, despite the weather, I'm here to set out the government's reasons for seeking to have that bill considered under emergency procedure, and it will in a movement, moment move the motion seeking Parliament's approval for that. The timetable proposed for dealing with this bill is not, as it has been for previous emergency bills, to deal with all stages in one day. Some of us are old enough to remember that procedure being used, for example, to restore tolls on the Erskine Bridge. It has only been used very sparingly since. Parliament is rightly sparing in its approval of the emergency procedure, but I'm proposing to Parliament today that we should um, consider this bill as an emergency measure over the next three weeks, starting with the Stage 1 debate next Wednesday, Stage 2 the week after that, and Stage 3 the following week. Of course. Tavis Scott. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the Minister for uh, uh, setting out the process he plans to follow. Would you accept that one of the main arguments is about adequate scrutiny of the measures we're considering, and in particular in relation to Stage 2, would it not be better that those uh, deliberations were heard in committee rather than in a plenary session of the whole chamber? I, um, yes. I want to make it clear that I'm laying out the, uh, the timetable as we wish to see it and as uh, is it contained in the motion. But I am committed to work with those who are willing to support the bill and to take this bill through to find ways to meet the concerns they have. For example, for increased scrutiny at stage two, to see whether there is an enhanced role for committees in that scrutiny. I am very keen, as I will say in a moment, to see maximum scrutiny of this bill, and I'll work with all the parties to achieve that. So I'd be happy to sit down and work, meet with the Liberals and meet with others to do so. And indeed, I've had meetings, with, of course. Minister, if, the, if the minister really is keen to ensure maximum scrutiny of this bill, as he's just said, why not make it an emergency bill at all? Well, minister. I'm about to deal with that point, uh, as the member knows, so let me do so. Um, I think that it is, uh, first and foremost, entirely fitting the bill which is about defending the interests and powers of this parliament, perhaps more than any other bill we have ever considered, it should be scrutinised, and if we are so minded, approved at all stages by the whole parliament. But scrutiny of this bill will extend beyond this chamber as it must. Presiding officer, I've committed myself to making myself and my officials available throughout the period to the parliament in committee, in plenary, and to parties and to relevant groups. I'll work tirelessly to make sure, so far as I am able, that the maximum possible scrutiny of the government's proposals takes place. The parliament and its committees are informed and engaged throughout. And if there are changes and developments in the timetable to come in that way, I will welcome them and I will work on them. I observed on Tuesday, presiding officer, that echoing your own words and your published views on the bill, this is a novel situation. In normal times, such a bill would follow a normal timetable. But these are not normal times. Consequently, after much serious consideration, both the Welsh Government and ourselves have concluded that if the continuity bills are to defend the principles of devolution during the Brexit process, if they are to achieve their purpose, then an emergency timetable is necessary. We both sought to avoid tabling such bills. We continue to negotiate seriously and in good faith with the UK government to try and secure an agreement regarding the UK's EU withdrawal bill that would allow our bills to be withdrawn or if they have been enacted, to be set aside. But the timetable for this process is being driven not by us, but by the timetable at Westminster for their withdrawal bill. It's likely that the third reading in the Lords will take place in early May. It will be submitted for royal assent shortly thereafter. It is essential that the continuity bills in Wales and Scotland become law before the EU withdrawal bill does. In the absence of an agreement about a common UK approach and in defence of devolution, this Parliament must prepare itself to assert, if it has to, the right to legislate itself about the devolved consequences of EU withdrawal. To do so, we must put in place the necessary safeguards and stopgaps, and this bill is at the heart of that process. Without it, not only are we defenceless, but our negotiating position as a government is severely weakened. We must not only have options and choices, we must be seen to have options and choices. And that's why I hope all parties in the Parliament will back the position I'm laying out today so that there is a united Scottish voice. 
a united Scottish voice, not a noisy Scottish voice. In addition, this timetable is necessary because if, and I hope that this does not come to pass, if no agreement can be reached over the EU withdrawal bill, and this Parliament chooses not to consent to it, then the UK Government and Parliament must be given the time to do what they have to do in response to that decision. They must amend their own EU withdrawal bill to remove the provisions not consented to and to amend it so that it can work with two continuity bills. Now, if we get to that stage, that would be a constructive alternative way forward. Not the best way, but a possible way, a workable way, a way that is being proposed in Wales and Scotland by governments taking a rational, thought-through approach rooted in the devol devolved settlements, which are supported by our fellow citizens and which are the established constitutional order of these islands. It's unfortunate to date the UK government has not shown a willingness to be as constructive and collaborative as Wales and Scotland. Neil Finlay. If the EU, EU withdrawal bill is amended to deliver the same or all of the elements of the continuity bill, what happens then? Another First, bill? Um, I, I've, made it, I've made it clear. I made it clear on Tuesday. I made it clear in discussion. I made it clear in response to a question from Mr. Harvey that, uh, that the chamber here can decide, but my view would be that this bill is no longer necessary and is therefore either not enacted or if it has been enacted, then it's taken away um, in those circumstances. I don't anticipate any circumstances in which there's a partial bill on either side because of the, the timetable that exists for challenging the bills, uh, 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 which I have outlined to, to Mr. Finlay earlier today, and I'm happy to outline to all members. I think that is a very unlikely eventuality, and I think not going to happen, but it is quite obvious that we have to do this in an emergency procedure if the bills are to fit together. Now, it's unfortunate that to date the UK government has not shown a willingness to be as constructive and collaborative as Wales and Scotland, but we'll go on trying to change that situation. We'll never get tired of sensible negotiation. I am confident that this parliament can give the bill the scrutiny it deserves in the next three weeks. I am happy to continue that discussion across the chamber and with parties in order to do so. Uh, this is by no means inflexible. This parliament and its committees have already held a large number of evidence sessions and debates on the EU withdrawal bill on which the continuity bill is modelled. The delegated powers and the finance and constitution committees have produced interim reports on that bill of the highest quality. The parliament is therefore already familiar with the approach and structure of this bill. It knows about the issues it raises. And I will ensure that the briefing material on this bill is made available as required and on the process of negotiation. I've made that commitment to the Labour Party today. We all understand the scale and gravity of the task we're now engaged in. Brexit has thrown us all sorts of responsibilities we didn't vote for, didn't seek and didn't want. But we mustn't allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by them or succumb to the temptation by doing nothing to allow them to prevail. I and the government stand ready to help the Parliament with the scrutinous bill in any and every way I can. And even more importantly, presiding officer, in conclusion, I'm sure this Parliament stands ready to defend the interests of the people of Scotland by ensuring good governance, which cannot come from diminishing devolution, but only by respecting and building on the work we all do in this chamber on behalf of our fellow citizens. Sometimes, and especially now, that requires us to do new things in new ways. So be it. Uh, presiding officer, I move that the Parliament agrees the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal and Continuity Scotland Bill be treated as an emergency bill. Thank you. I call on Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The core problem with the motion that the Minister has just moved is that there is no emergency. And we don't need to take my word for that, because that's exactly what the Lord Advocate told this Parliament yesterday. Yesterday, the Lord Advocate came to this chamber and said that the reason why, in his view, this bill is within legislative competence is because none of its material provisions can come into force until after the United Kingdom has left the European Union. And we know that that cannot happen for another 13 months. So yesterday, the Lord Advocate says that we've got a year and a month to legislate. Today, Mr. Russell says we've got three weeks to legislate. Now, it strikes me that you don't need to be a professor of constitutional law to spot the glaring and manifest inconsistency <laughs> with what the SNP is saying. <laughs> Presiding officer, emergency legislation should be avoided wherever possible. That's our starting position. Why? Because emergency legislation denies effective parliamentary scrutiny. 
There have been cries from right across this chamber since the withdrawal bill was published um, uh, that uh, the devolution settlement must be respected. And those are indeed cries in which we have participated and joined. But today, presiding officer, it is the SNP who are treating this parliament with disdain in seeking to rush through controversial legislation, significant elements of which may well be beyond our competence altogether. This isn't respecting the devolution settlement and it's not respecting this parliament. The government's own policy memorandum accompanying this bill says about this bill that it will, and I quote, add to the complexity of the post-exit position and it will present serious logistical challenges. Well, on that, we agree. This is a bill that will add complexity and will pose significant uh, challenges, which are two further reasons why it should not be fast-tracked. On Tuesday, presiding officer, we said that the continuity bill was unwelcome and unnecessary. We stand by that, and today we add to it. It is unwelcome, it is unnecessary, and it is dangerous. Because it is when we legislate in haste that we legislate in error. And this is an invitation from the SNP today to make bad law. And it is an invitation from the SNP today to make law badly. And to those invitations, we on these benches say no thank you. It is... Patrick Harvey. Member for giving way. I just wonder if he's used the same indignant voice to David Mundell, the minister who is in the government which has failed... The Minister in the Government which has repeatedly failed to make the UK Bill remotely acceptable or compatible with devolution. Yeah. Adam Tompkins. It's, it's not David Mundell who is trying to railroad unconstitutional constitutional legislation through this Parliament. It's the SNP, supported by the Scottish Green Party, as usual. Presiding Officer, it is, as we heard earlier this week, unprecedented for any Scottish Government of any political colour to press ahead with a bill over the advice of the presiding officer that that bill is beyond competence. That fact alone should make us pause. By ploughing on regardless, we risk bringing our parliament into disrepute and, it seems to me, we are going out of our way to invite all but inevitable challenge in the courts. Let us look briefly at the legislation we are being asked to fast track, because even to a lawyer, this legislation is far from clear-cut. First, there is the vexed issue of competence. The Lord Advocate and the presiding officer focused on the compatibility of this bill with EU law in their respective statements about competence. But that is not the only legal limit on our lawmaking powers. It is also the case, and again, this goes to the core of respecting the devolution settlement, it is also the case that we may not make law relating to matters that are properly reserved to the United Kingdom Parliament. Section 6 of this bill provides for the legal status of the principle of supremacy of EU law. Yet, among the matters which the Scotland Act reserves to the UK Parliament are international relations, relations with the European Union and its institutions. So how is a provision on the principle of the supremacy of EU law, not one that relates to the reserved matter of the European Union and its institutions. This is precisely the sort of matter that requires detailed, careful parliamentary scrutiny with the help and assistance of the testimony of independent expert witnesses, all of which is, of course, a feature of our ordinary legislative process, but which will be cut by any decision today to fast-track this bill. It's not just a question of scrutinising the competence of this bill, however, that will be curtailed. It's scrutiny of the bill's content as well. And that content is not exactly straightforward, is it, presiding officer? Let's take an example. Section 5 of this bill provides that to the extent that there is a right of action in Scots law immediately before exit day based on a failure to comply with any of the general principles of EU law, there is on and after exit day an equivalent right. Fine. But among the general principles of EU law is the doctrine of state liability. That's to say the right that we all have to sue for damages for a sufficiently serious breach by a public authority of their legal obligations. So yet section 8 provides that there is no right in Scots law on or after exit day to damages 
in accordance with the rule in Frankovich. But Frankovich is simply the name of the case in which the European Court invented the doctrine of state liability. So Section 5 preserves the right to sue public authorities for damages, and Section 8 takes it away as a manifest and straightforward incompatibility between, between two provisions uh, of the legislation, which is not, by the way, shared in the European Union Withdrawal Bill, because Section 5 is one of those provisions of this bill that goes out of its way to distinguish itself from the European Union Withdrawal Bill. So we are being asked to consider in haste legislation which the Scottish Government doesn't understand, legislation which has been badly drafted, legislation which is manifestly incoherent. We're being invited to make bad law, presiding officer, and we're being invited to make it badly. No thank you. Call Neil Finlay. The uh, actions of this parliament impact on the lives of our citizens from John O'Groats to the Mull of Galloway, and the implications of our decisions and the passing of bills can be huge for people and communities. Therefore, we must all take our individual and collective responsibility very seriously indeed. This Parliament has established practices, conventions and standing orders that are designed to protect our democracy and ensure that laws, the laws we pass are subject to proper and in-depth scrutiny and where necessary amendment to make them as effective and workable as possible. Uh, whilst we sit as members of this place in a very privileged position, we do not do so as part of a political bubble disconnected from the outside world. The public have rights within our system. They have the right to be consulted on decisions that will affect them. They have the right to submit their views and lobby their MSPs for change. The right to petition, right to submit evidence. Evidence that can significantly change a bill. But in this case, uh, that either will not happen or will be severely curtailed by a truncated parliamentary timescale of just a few weeks. Uh, we should ignore, not ignore our history. Rushed legislation, as we know, is often bad legislation, and there are many examples of this over the years. Uh, the Scottish Government and the Minister tells us that legislation, this legislation has to be passed within the short timescale, but failed to explain why there is such a rush. Uh, and the Government tells us that crucial, the crucial stage two of the process will be taken in the chamber and not in committee. We have very serious reservations uh, and concerns about this. Having such a vital stage of a bill taken in a full and at times rowdy chamber with all the distractions of this place is a poor replacement for the in-depth, focused scrutiny and the ebb and flow of detailed committee work. Yes, certainly. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to Mr Finlay for giving way. I don't think any of us would imagine that this situation is perfect or can be made perfect. But does he accept that if we fail to take responsibility for examining and debating and passing Scottish legislation in this chamber, we will leave the UK government with a perfect excuse to impose something upon us which we have all across this chamber decided is unacceptable? Neil Findlay. I, I certainly do have some sympathy with that, but what I want to ensure is that this place does things as best as we possibly can when we have that opportunity. And uh, so we would, we would want stage two to take place as normal in the more effective committee room setting. No MSP will be ex excluded from that process. Uh, President officer, this situation should of course be entirely avoidable. David Mundell and Ruth Davison ratted on a commitment given to this parliament and the Welsh Assembly that all powers that would ordinarily, ordinarily be devolved will be following Brexit. I understand that there are 25 areas of disagreement. It's my view that in the interest of openness, transparency and accountability, that these 25 areas of disagreement are published so we know what this dispute is all about. That is not an unreasonable request. But what I find most depressing is that even at this stage, that the two governments cannot bring themselves to find their way to an agreeable solution or process with independent adjudication if necessary, where no one has a veto and the decision of that adjudication is accepted. Surely, rather than have to go through these constitutional contortions, ministers from both sides will step up to the plate and get this sorted. Finally, can I ask a few questions of the minister? If the EU withdrawal bill lacks clarity and is ambiguous, as he has said, and the continuity bill seeks to replicate it, it, replicate it does that leave us with an ambiguous opaque bill too. Uh, in the bill, it states ministers can determine exit day. Is the government suggesting that exit day in Scotland would be different? If not, why is it in this bill? 
If the bill is passed, does the minister expect Clause 11 of the EU withdrawal bill to be withdrawn? If the aim is to legislate uh, before the EU withdrawal bill is on the statute book, has the government factored in for any legal challenge by anyone that may scupper that timescale and that objective? And finally, given the volume of work, does the Cabinet Secretary believe the Scottish Government in this Parliament has the capacity to deliver the huge volume of work required to enact this legislation? These are just some, a very, a very small number of the very serious questions and they need very serious answers. Colin Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I certainly agree with those final comments from Mr Finlay that there are very serious questions about this process and they need very serious answers. But we will only be able to begin that process if we pass today the resolution to designate this bill as an emergency bill. This bill is absolutely necessary as a response to the Brexit crisis. The Brexit crisis is not of this Parliament's choosing. It is not of the choosing of the people in Scotland who we represent. It is a crisis which has been brought about entirely by the Conservative Party. And the UK, whatever our attitude to the Scotland's constitutional debate, this is a point that should be relevant across that divide. The UK government now appears to be at war with itself, incompetent, and in the grip of delusional hard right ideologues. People who are willing to put their own interests ahead of the national interest, people who are willing to inflict serious damage on the economy and even put the peace process in Northern Ireland at risk for their pet political project. And their bill, their EU withdrawal bill at Westminster is a direct assault on the devolution settlement. They have missed far too many opportunities already to fix, to repair that bill and to achieve something that can gain the consent or that deserves to gain the consent either of this parliament or of the Welsh Assembly. This parliament, MSPs across the political spectrum must now take responsibility for taking forward legislation which safeguards our law, including social and environmental protections built up in the European Union, protects the devolution settlement and ensures that parliament is in control of the process not government. And I make that point in relation to both minority governments. Neither the government at the UK level nor in this parliament represents a majority. And so parliamentary control must mean the majority in parliament, not the minority of government. I give way. Joanne Lamond. I wonder, given your party is, sits on, on the Bureau, would you make a commitment to consider fully all suggestions around the way in which we could scrutinise this bill fully, not just in the chamber, but in committee. I, I absolutely get that commitment, and many of those discussions have already taken place. As I said uh, the other day in the chamber, the first time it was suggested that emergency legislation might be necessary, I made the point very clearly that the maximum speed that our standing orders allow would be entirely unacceptable and that whether or not a lead committee was formally designated, committees should take evidence, uh, both from external witnesses and from the government. I'm pleased that that is happening in at least two committees. Others I know are considering their work programs uh, over the coming weeks and are trying to fit in opportunities. Look, none of us are capable of achieving perfection from this chaotic constitutional crisis which the Conservative UK government has created but we are capable of improving the situation. If we don't have this Scottish alternative to the EU withdrawal bill, we will leave the UK government in a position where they will be able to force an unacceptable bill on us, fatally undermining the devolution settlement. Mm -hmm. There can be no doubt that this is an emergency situation and that this bill must be treated under the emergency procedures but it is far more significant than any previous emergency bill. And so I agree with Joanne Lamont and others, we must maximize the scrutiny which is possible within the time available. So we will also take action to improve this bill, uh, 
Caroline Lucas, my colleague at Westminster, has worked with opposition MPs across the political spectrum at Westminster to improve the legislation. We will seek to do the same here, putting forward positive ideas, and I urge the government to work constructively with opposition proposals to change and improve their bill. But we certainly, presiding officer, will support the resolution to de designate this bill as an emergency response to an emergency situation. I call on, I call on Tavish Scott. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, next week's stage one debate uh, will be indeed on Brexit, on the Tory government of Westminster and the powers of this parliament. Today is about the process, about legislation, yes, and about the scrutiny of that legislation. But just one point on Brexit. For many of us, Mr Tompkins, leaving the EU is an emergency, just is an emergency. So, so, so for uh, many of us, uh, this is also about pressure on the UK government. We should not be here. Uh, this is not the Parliament should be dealing with this legislation at all, but we are having to do uh, something uh, to make sure the powers of this Parliament are protected, and that is the purpose uh, of this continuity uh, bill. Uh, now, I'm grateful to the uh, Minister for what he has said on stage two. Uh, we can overdo this point about process, we can overdo uh, parliamentary arguments about why legislation should be properly scrutinised, but uh, arguably in this case it has never been more so. And that's why I suspect across all the parties, uh, the request of the government and the request of the parliamentary authorities, the Bureau, to make sure that this legislation is scrutinised properly and fully in stage two, I think is very profound to this. And it was especially the case and made yesterday by the Lord Advocate. It is uh, fairly uh, different times when we have a, a legal view from our presiding officer and a different legal view from our Lord Advocate. And just to compound uh, the complexity of this issue, we have the Welsh Government and the Welsh Assembly taking a view as well, which is consistent in terms of the continuity bill with our government here in Scotland, but a Welsh BO who's also had to make a ruling uh, on the legislative competence of that uh, legislation. So there are a number of aspects here which are um, profoundly important. And on this, I agree with Adam Tompkins that the importance of external advice, of external experts, of people who would wish to uh, give a view both on the legality of these measures and on the different legal interpretations is profoundly uh, important to it. We don't all live for the next submission from the Faculty of Advocates, but actually uh, on this uh, kind of issue, on the importance of uh, what we are considering, then they and many other organisations will have important things to say about this. Now, the Lord Advocate wasn't keen to answer some hypothetical questions. He did answer a few, I thought, yesterday, but uh, he certainly wasn't keen to answer some hypothetical uh, questions yesterday. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I sense that there will be plenty of our legal friends across Scotland who will be uh, pretty keen to give voice to their thoughts on this. Now, how much that matters will be for Parliament to consider, and that's why Patrick Harvey, Joanne Lamont, and many others who, and certainly on my uh, side of the chamber, who feel very strongly that this should be stage two in committee, uh, 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 th that's why that uh, particularly uh, matters uh, in that sense. So this is, yes, presiding officer, uh, about putting pressure on the United uh, Kingdom government. Uh, the timetable is, uh, too, uh, uh, is, is incredibly tight. That is uh, certainly uh, true. The other side to the consideration of this measure in committee is to allow for a full examination of that timetable uh, as well. And I think that is a profoundly important point in terms of uh, Parliament's ability to actively and properly scrutinise uh, proposed uh, legislation. So we in these benches uh, want to make sure that that uh, stage two is taken in committee, but we understand the importance of the measures that are being brought in front of us. Uh, we, we want to make sure that the, the timetable that sets this out does that, but make sure it does it in a way which Parliament takes a full and appropriate role. Thank you very much. I now call on Joan McAlpine to be followed by Maurice Golden. Joan McAlpine. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to speak today in support of this continuity bill being treated as an emergency bill. It's vital that this bill is passed ahead of the EU withdrawal bill, uh, which contains measures which amount to the greatest attack on this Parliament's powers since it was first established. When Scotland's first First Minister, Donald Dewar, addressed the first meeting of this reconvened parliament, he said, quote, we reach back through the long haul to win this parliament through the struggles of those who brought democracy to Scotland. Donald Dewar is seen by many as the architect of devolution, but in that tribute, he himself explained that it had many architects he may have been thinking, in particular of the late John P. McIntosh, whose life commemorated outside 
the Chamber today, but he was also paying tribute to the many people whose names are now unknown, who laid the foundation stones of this place, not physically, but in their ideas, their actions, and perhaps more importantly, their ambitions for their country. The UK government's determination to diminish the powers of this parliament using the EU withdrawal bill is more than a constitutional assault. This parliament is the voice of the Scottish people and any attack on it seeks to silence the Scottish people and we cannot allow that to happen. Devolution has been seen uh, by the, as the people of Scotland embarking on a democratic journey. And since 1999, we have made considerable progress along that road. The proposals in the UK government's EU withdrawal bill do not just stop Scotland's people moving forward in their journey, they put us into reverse. The Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee is the secondary committee on this bill and despite the type timetable, committee members are keen to conduct some scrutiny of the bill and have already discussed ways that we can do that. The timetable is tight, but it's a timetable that has been forced on this parliament by the UK government and the 10 year that they have shown on devolution. The Conservative Party opposed the establishment of this parliament originally and paid the price at the ballot box. But in recent years, there has been consensus across the parliament, including the Conservatives, on the importance of maintaining the settlement that Dewar achieved. The Europe Committee report on determining Scotland's future relationship with the EU was published in March last year after extensive evidence gathering. It concluded, we believe that any power currently a competence of the EU that is to be repatriated after Brexit and which is not currently listed in Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act 1998 should be fully devolved along with, alongside a funding mechanism resulting in no detriment to Scotland. That conclusion was supported by all members of the committee, including Conservative colleagues. Perhaps they were reassured by evidence given to the committee by David Mundell, the Secretary of State for Scotland, when he told us, I am not looking to take away any powers that are currently exercised by the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government. But taking powers away from the Scottish Parliament is exactly what the UK EU withdrawal bill does. Mr Mundell failed to bring forward the Commons Amendment to stop that power grab, although he had promised to do so. He should have known the consequences of his inaction and his false promises. The UK Government is taking a sledgehammer, not just to Donald Dewar's devolution settlements, but to the hopes, aspirations and efforts of the many generations whose struggles brought democracy to Scotland and brought this Parliament into being. That, in my view, is an emergency and it demands an emergency response. Thank you. I call Morris Golden to be followed by Joanne Lamont. Morris Golden. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The continuity bill is not an emergency bill. Indeed, as it stands, the Lord Advocate was unable yesterday to make a convincing argument that the bill is even in the competence of the Scottish Parliament. I say this on the basis of three counts. The continuity bill cannot be brought into effect now because it trespasses on EU law. The eventual effect of the bill, if enacted, may not impinge upon EU law following the UK's withdrawal, but as of today, this means that the legal competence of the bill is out with the auspices of the Scottish Parliament. The question of competence when it comes to compatibility with EU law is a matter of current legal validity, not future effect. That is the key point of legal analysis on which the presiding officer has relied upon in coming to his decision, and I think he was correct. Secondly, we would contend that EU law continues to be relevant to the competence of this parliament irrespective of whether the UK is a member of the EU or not. The continuity bill implies that the Parliament, as a public body, can be constrained by EU law only for as long as the United Kingdom is a member state of the European Union. However, the Westminster Parliament, when creating this Parliament, have legislated to confirm the applicability and associated constraints remain irrespective of the status of the United Kingdom. Patrick Harvey. Patrick Harvey. 
honestly, is the member genuinely suggesting that it was the intention of the UK Parliament to bind this Parliament to treaties from which the UK had withdrawn? Is that really his suggestion? Maurice Golden. What the law says. Not a very good lawyer. That's what the law says, yep. Mr Harvey, and you should get up to speed with that. Now, the, now the, third, the third aspect of why this bill is out with the competence of this Parliament, and that is that this Parliament cannot legislate on reserved matters. The bill sets out provisions on the principle of supremacy of EU law, and we would contend that this relates to reserved matters, thus confirming that the bill is out with the competence of this Parliament. Therefore, we have established that the Continuity Bill is out with the competence of this Parliament, and I am confident that the Supreme Court would agree that with this analysis, if required, and in due course. Now, I would like to turn briefly to the particular case of whether this bill should be considered as an emergency bill. The Scottish Parliament's guidance on bills defines an emergency bill as a government bill that needs to be enacted more rapidly than the normal timetable would allow. The continuity bill cannot have effect until March 2019, and therefore this criteria cannot be met. It's worth remembering that half of the previous uses of emergency legislation procedure responded to court cases, another two responded to situations where obvious uh, legislative loopholes have been created had they not been passed, and one assured passage of the budget. The present case does not respond to a court case, and no major loopholes in existing legislation would be created if it were passed in due time by the correct procedure. That's why pushing the continuity bill through is a concern in terms of full parliamentary scrutiny. That is required in order that we pass full and efficient and proper law and creating an emergency aspect for this bill will not do this. Parliament will not be served. I call on Joanne Lamont to be followed by Ivan McKee. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I say that I am very concerned about this debate, not least, I have to say, by the fact that one million people who voted to leave the European Union seem not even to be factored into any of our debates around Europe just now. And I do think that is something that we need to think about. And I say that as somebody who voted Remain. And, but in this debate, I only, I'm not speaking particularly for my party position in this, but I do want, and I'm trying to think through the questions as a parliamentarian. Because I think it is important that we come to this highly unusual set of circumstances with our minds open to the arguments being presented on all sides and the willingness to test these issues, not to close them down. And I'm troubled by a number of things. And I would look for some reassurance that we're not setting unwise precedents here. Now, I should say, I accept that the issues around Brexit are unprecedented. And it's difficult to have predicted um, exactly where our country now finds ourselves on this question. And on balance, I accept the need for government to explore options to protect the devolution settlement. But we cannot press the need to protect this institution by being tempted into being cavalier with the procedures that have underpinned it and have embedded it as an institution. So I am concerned that the presiding officer has ruled the bill is not competent. That must matter. And if it doesn't matter, what is the purpose of the presiding officer having this authority? We should not take this step lightly. Further, I am concerned at the compressed consideration of the bill. We are told this is an emergency procedure. But if we can, in the interest of the Parliament, step away from our usual processes, then we should not be constrained by a definition of an emergency procedure, procedure that could not have imagined the circumstances in which we now find ourselves. I do not think, frankly, it is for a government minister to indicate that all stages should be in chamber so that all members can be involved. It is not a government job. I also do not accept that that constitutes proper scrutiny. Now, I don't pretend to have a full grasp of all the issues explored and tested in the Parliament in its daily workings. 
I am happy to delegate responsibility to committees to explore and test these ideas for me. And then I can reflect on their conclusions at stage one. You can't cross-examine in the chamber. You cannot generate a dialogue. And that is what we need. Patrick Harvey. I, I'm grateful. Is the member reassured at all by the fact that the Finance and Constitution Committee is already planning to take evidence not only from external witnesses but also from the government uh, and has held open the option of doing so at every stage of this bill? Joanne Lamont. I am reassured that I would contend I would go slightly further than Tavish Scott in this. I think the stage one process is a critical stage where it affords the opportunities for voices outside the parliament to draw conclusions on the general principles of the bill. Now, I was very struck yesterday by the tone and thoughtfulness of the Lord Advocate. And to be fair, none of us would pretend that Prof Professor Tompkins is without some awareness of the relevant issues. But I was also struck by how far distant I felt from the argument altogether. I would want to see the government argument tested and that of those who do not support the bill. There was unanimity on the problem that this bill is seeking to address. Why do we not have unanimity on the need for the bill itself? That is the job of the parliamentary process. Only by serious scrutiny can we draw conclusions about what is substantial and what is simply about party considerations. We need to know the difference between those two. So on balance, I accept the argument that the bill should be introduced. But I would want a commitment that the Parliament will explore the role of the presiding officer in certification of bills, if not now, then at some point in the near future. But I would also make a plea that while this bill is introduced, if seen as urgent, that does not mean that the timetable should be collapsed in a way that overly restricts scrutiny and precludes witnesses external to this parliament being heard. If this bill is controversial and ends up in court, it's in the interest of this parliament to be shown to have taken its scrutiny role seriously at every stage. So I say this in all seriousness to the government minister himself, who has already clearly made some helpful words here, but also to parliamentarians across this chamber. If our mission is to protect the parliament, we must not ourselves act to undermine it. Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you. Um, sometimes, presiding officer, life deals you a bad hand and you have to struggle on bravely through the trials and tribulations, putting a brave face on it. And sometimes you have to but admire the tenacity of those who do just that, facing up to adversity and all life can throw at them, turning up for work each day, trying to make the most of it. The Scottish Tory front bench presiding officer finds himself in such a position at the moment, faced as they are with the shambles of Brexit. Remainers to a man and a woman, they're faced with a situation not of their making, marching in a direction they know is mistaken, to the beat of a drum, irregular at best, often incoherent, in the knowledge that those directing traffic have no idea what is around the next corner, far less how to deal with it. And if that, if that was not bad enough, they are faced with a leadership that sometimes looks like it's deliberately sabotaging their efforts. Being sent to the crease, dare I say, only to find their bat has been broken by the team captain. A Tory party in disarray of our Europe presiding officer is nothing new. Promised they were by no less an authority figure than the Secretary of State for Scotland himself that all would be well. That Clause 11 of the Sorry, EU Mr. McKee, withdrawal we've got a point bill. Sorry, Mr. McKee, point of order from Jamie Green. Excellent. <laughs> I thought this was the debate was around the uh, competency of whether this should be treated as an emergency bill. I haven't heard a single word from the member whether uh, this should be treated as an emergency bill or not. Would you like to come to any point on that uh, at all? Indeed. Uh, now, thank Thank Mr Green for the point of order. I, I have to say, Mr McKee, I was thinking something along the same lines of, would, would the member please address the central point of the emergency motion? Thank you. Emergency procedure. I, I, I was, of course, addressing myself to the remarks made by uh, Maurice Golden earlier on. Um, so where was I? 
Clause 11 of the EU withdrawal bill would be amended safely in time before leaving the House of Commons where it was not to be. We now find ourselves in March. The clock is ticking. Commitments made by members of the UK government seem to be of little value. So they troop into the TV studios to defend the indefensible, trying to spin their out of a mess that somebody else has created and continues to create on a daily basis. And so to the specifics of the bill we are debating today. It's intent and it's timing. Why is such a bill necessary and why is it necessary now? In politics, as in life, trust is an essential commodity. In an environment where trust has been built up over time, actors can behave accordingly, cutting some slack, understanding where there is give and where there is take, securing the knowledge that working together to find a common solution is in everyone's interest. But when that trust has been destroyed, possibly deliberately so, then it's no surprise that we find ourselves in this position. When little communication has taken place on the fundamental issues around Brexit and how they will affect Scotland, it is no surprise that considerable doubt exists as to the goodwill and intent to find a solution that protects the Scottish devolution settlement. The Scottish Tories know... Sure. Uh, Neil Finlay. I don't know, I'm not sure if there's another um, uh, SNP speaker in this debate, but surely someone on the SNP backbenches has got something to say about the concerns about the scrutiny in this building. Or is it just the case? Or is it just the case that they are whipped so hard that none of them can express any concern ever? Ivan McKee. The issue we've got, and I'm coming to address time, is we are where we are because of the actions of the UK government. This bill has got to go through in time, and that is the reality of it, to protect the devolution settlement. The Scottish Tories know fine well, and Mr Finlay knows fine well, the Scottish Government has waited until the last possible date before launching this continuity bill. To leave it any longer would mean that it would not be able to be enacted prior to the passing of the EU withdrawal bill, an essential prerequisite for a continuity bill to take effect as intended. In fact, the way the Scottish Tories argue against the emergency procedure suggests they know this all too well, but have no desire to see the protections offered by the continuity bill put in place. In summary, presiding officer, this bill is necessary to protect the powers of this parliament. It is the backstop that provides some protection for us from the Brexit chaos that's consuming the UK government. And the timing of this bill being brought forward now is necessary to ensure that those safeguards are in place in sufficient time. But we should also not lose sight of the bigger picture. By intent or by omission, the actions of the UK government represent a significant threat to the devolution settlement. It's our duty and our responsibility of members of this Scottish Parliament to protect that settlement. And that is what we shall have the opportunity to do over the coming weeks by passing this emergency bill. Thank you. I'm, I'm conscious that we're very tight for time, but there's also a great deal of interest. And Mike Rumbles, uh, if you can make your remarks very short, one minute or so. Thank, thank you, Presiding Officer. Unless the Parliament decides, the standing order says that unless the Parliament decides on a motion of the Parliament Bureau, stages one to three of an emergency bill should be taken on the same day. That's because by convention, an emergency bill has all party support as an intended to fix an immediate problem in Scots law, which cannot wait. Evidently, there is not all party support for this bill, and there is not an immediate issue which cannot wait. By taking this as an emergency bill, the government ensures that all the stages must be taken by a committee of the whole house, and that's the problem. We don't have the ability to call witnesses and examine evidence. We could have had a different way. We could have suspended standing orders to allow stage two to have been taken by a committee uh, 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 in Parliament, and that would have been the better route to have chosen. I will reluctantly vote for this motion today, but only on the basis that the Finance Committee, Constitution Committee will take formal evidence from witnesses on the bill before we get in this chamber to a vote on the stage two process. Thank you. Thank you for keeping your remarks brief there, Mr Rumbles. I call on Claire Baker to wind up for the Labour Party. Thank you, President Officer. This is a bill that we wish wasn't before us and an emergency process that we wish wasn't necessary. The preferred outcome would be an EU withdrawal bill from the UK Government that the devolved governments and the Parliament could support. So why are we in this regrettable situation? There are shared serious concerns about the UK Government's approach and so far the assurances that this would be fixed have been hollow. 
Make no mistake, the Conservative Government is the reason we are facing this situation today and their failure to respond sufficiently to the concerns of the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly is deeply disappointing and brings us to the response that has been brought forward today in order to work to safeguard our laws. But how can MSPs be confident in the legislation? There is a degree of legal uncertainty when we look at the position of the presiding officer and the Lord Advocate, and it does seem inevitable that this legislation will end up in the Supreme Court. We will work constructively on this legislation, but we can't ignore the challenges we face in dealing with such a significant piece of legislation as an emergency. As members will know, it is rare for us to deal with emergency legislation. And I don't believe it has happened in a situation similar to the one we are facing just now. This is a rushed piece of legislation and it is important that MSPs can fully engage with the process and have confidence in our considerations. Our business manager has made requests of the Bureau for MSPs to be properly supported and informed. This is a complex piece of legislation with a number of different outcomes facing us. Uh, MSPs, I think, this afternoon have made clear the importance of scrutiny and have asked what opportunities there will be for members to exercise this. We do have concerns over Stage 2 in particular, which in ordinary circumstances provides us an opportunity for debate, for compromise, for consensus building, all taking place within the setting of a committee room, which members will recognise as a much different atmosphere from that we often experience in the Chamber. It often in the committee gives us time for more considered reflection than the sometimes heightened atmosphere we experience within the chamber. So is it possible for MSPs to have greater clarity over the point of consideration when it comes to division between the two covered governments? This was a point raised by Neil Finlay in his comments. It would be helpful for MSPs to have a greater understanding of where the points of disagreement are between the two governments. Um, there seems to be a level of agreement that frameworks are necessary, but it is important that we could have greater transparency, which would help us make a judgment on the legislation that we are about to um, examine. So this is far from an ideal situation. We are facing an extremely truncated legislative process, which is frankly unacceptable, but we do accept that we are left here with little choice. The failure of the UK government to resolve this situation is the latest test we have seen to devolution over the settlement. The, set, the devolution settlement, and this time, the rest of the devolution settlement comes from the party that the so-called so defenders of the union. Devolution is the settled will of the Scottish people, and Labour has been consistent in supporting devolution, in defending devolution, and in making the case for devolution. We have led the charge at Westminster with amendments to attempt to fix this bill, due to the lack of resolve, initiative and political will that has come from the Conservative Government. But in closing, I would urge the UK Government and the Scottish Government, along with the Welsh Government, <coughs> to strain every sinew to find a, a solution in the short time that we face, so that we can avoid having to proceed with this, which at the moment I accept is necessary, but it is a challenging and it is a problematic piece of legislation that we are having to deal with. Thank you. Thank you. I call on Donald Cameron. Presiding officer, we're confronted today by a narrow but fundamentally important issue, whether the continuity bill should be treated as an emergency bill. And the short answer is no, for several reasons. First, there is a convention that emergency legislation is required to deal with emerging events that require an instant reaction from Parliament. The very first act of this Parliament was, in fact, emergency legislation. I'm sure there will be members who recall it, the mental health Public Safety and Appeals Scotland Act was introduced to close a gap in the existing legislation identified by a court decision. Five other acts which originated as emergency bills followed the same pattern, with one exception, a budget. But they were all specific bills re responding to unique ad hoc events, often court decisions, requiring urgent legislation. And with respect, the situation we find ourselves in in relation to the continuity bill in no way fits with that tradition. Yep. There is also a convention that emergency bills achieve consensus, as Mike Rumbles has said. And given the diversity of opinion expressed today, that cannot be said to exist either. Secondly, there is a question over timing. The bill is not remotely an emergency. It cannot have effect exactly. till after the UK leaves the EU. That point was central to the Lord Advocate's argument yesterday on competence. He said that the bill was within competence 
precisely because it would not take effect until after Brexit happens. When he, I'm sorry, I don't have time. When he spoke about there being an urgent, practical necessity, that was in relation to the law operating after withdrawal, namely the 29th of March 2019, a year away. So the actual urgency here is not in the coming weeks, but in the aftermath of Brexit Day next year. Thirdly, and the most important reason to reject the motion, is the role of this parliament and all of us within it. The issue of emergency legislation isn't an arcane debate about rules of procedure. It isn't about navigating the dry technical pages of the standing orders, dusted off so that lawyers and pedants can have some fun. It goes to the very purpose of what we do as a legislature. Yeah. The Continuity Bill represents fundamental constitutional legislation. It's about the powers of the parliament, as the minister just said. It's perhaps the most sweeping legislation that has been presented to this parliament in terms of what it seeks to achieve by ensuring EU law is carried over into Scots law. Yes, Patrick. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. And can I assure the member that the only people having fun in this situation are expensively educated idiots like Rhys Mogg and Boris Johnson. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Harvey, Mr. Harvey, can Mr. I... Harvey, Let... Mr. Harvey. Mr. Harvey, the, the members that you named are not members of this parliament, but I still urge you to be respectful to everybody you describe in this chamber. I, I certainly, I certainly... Order, please. So, I th Mr. Sorry, I, I, I will allow Mr. Cameron, I will allow you the extra minute to just allow Mr. Cameron to finish his question, if he makes it. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I certainly offer those gentlemen the respect they deserve. <laughs> they... All right, Mr. Harvey, that's, Can Mr. I just Harvey, that's ask... quite enough. Mr. Cameron. Mr. Harvey, if that's we were quite to... enough. That's quite enough, Mr. Harvey. That's quite enough. If... Mr. Cameron, please continue. Thank you. Yeah. So, certainly regret taking that intervention, presiding Absolutely. officer. If there's one area where we shouldn't legislate in a hurry, it's the Constitution. Yeah. The Scottish Government's very own policy memorandum says it will add complexity and present serious logistical challenges. We also have the unprecedented scenario that you, presiding officer, have taken the view that this bill is out with legislative competence and is thus unlawful and beyond our powers. If any bill requires proper, measured, detailed scrutiny, yeah. it is this yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. How, long, how long does the proposed timetable give us? I don't have time. One day a week over three, one day a week, over three weeks. Three days, presiding officer. Three days for the bill to be assessed by this parliament's many committees. Three days for the bill to receive due scrutiny from MSPs. Three days for the bill to be debated, amended and critiqued. Such a timetable is patently insufficient. So my appeal today is to MSPs of all political stripes, but it is an appeal especially to the conveners and deputy conveners of every committee of this parliament. It's an appeal to the deputy presiding officers. It's an appeal to those MSPs who prize their role as parliamentarians yeah. just as highly as their role as party politicians. Whatever your views on the conduct, whatever your views on the conduct of the UK government or the Scottish government in the current negotiations, whatever your views on common frameworks and internal markets, whatever your views on the rights and wrongs of Brexit, and however passionately held, the motion today is about how we, as a parliament, legislate. Yes, exactly. it, goes, it goes to the core of what we do and how we do it and the precedents we set and the people we represent. The devolution settlement is a precious, finely balanced thing. We all share the belief that it needs protection. But as parliamentarians, presiding officer, how can we possibly, how can we possibly protect that settlement by curtailing our well-worn procedures yeah. and rushing through legislation care, on the Constitution exactly. of dubious legality by treating this as some kind of national emergency, I urge you to vote against the motion. I call the Minister Michael Russell to conclude. Officer, um, I do regret the Conservative view, I have to say, because we as a government, I've been endeavouring to work with the Conservatives to find a way through a very difficult 
I, I'm going to treat this very seriously, presiding officer, and I hope the Conservative front bench will do the same. We, we, have been working, we have been working very hard to try and work with the Conservatives in this Parliament and in the, in the UK to try and find a way to defend this Parliament and the powers of this Parliament. We've done it across the parties. We've met, uh, I won't go into detail, but we've met regularly uh, with all the parties and we would hope to continue to do so. So I, I regret the tone, but I also regret the attempt to create a, a false division here. Because there is an emergency and there's no doubt about those circumstances. I want to treat this summing up in two, with two parts. One is to deal with the question of the emergency and then deal with the very serious questions that have been raised by a number of members uh, about the procedures of this parliament. In terms of the emergency, the, this is an emergency in almost any definition you wish to apply. It's an emergency in, in terms of the timing of this. The EU withdrawal bill from the UK government was published on the 13th of July last year. On the 19th of September last year, the Welsh and Scottish governments tabled, uh, brought forward their amendments. We had nothing in writing in terms of an amendment to the bill from the UK government until the second half of February this year. We have shown extraordinary restraint in the process of negotiation in terms of trying to get the change which in November and early December the UK government accepted they wanted to bring forward. And there is still no tabling of that amendment. So it is an emergency, I agree with Tavish Scott, Brexit itself is an emergency. There's an emergency in sense of the way in which the UK government has treated the two other governments engaged in this. Regrettably, there is no government in Northern Ireland by refusing to accept that they have a responsibility to bring these matters form forward timorously. But there's also an emergency in the definition that Donald Cameron used. He used the words unique and ad hoc. Brexit is a unique set of circumstances and the circumstance, the ad hoc circumstance that brought us here is the impending failure of those negotiations despite the good efforts of the Welsh and Scottish governments to try and get change. And the third point on emergency is the most ridiculous of all. Because under the argument of whether or not this could be done now but should be done on sometime after March 2019, on the definition that we've heard, you could not even bring emergency legislation to this chamber on this matter on the 28th of March 2019 because it would be in anticipation of leaving. So you could only bring it after you have left. How a ridiculous point of view. So, no, I'm sorry, I have hardly any time to go through this. We have been working... We have been working to endeavour to get a solution and we will continue to work to get a solution. Let me now turn, before I turn to some of the points of detail, let me just turn to the very serious point that have been raised in terms of the procedures of this Parliament. And, and Neil Finlay asked, uh, and quite legitimately asked, was there no one on the SNP benches who was concerned about scrutiny? Yes, I'm concerned about scrutiny. That is why I wish to have as wide a debate as possible and to move, and to move as firmly as possibly I can with the Labour Party, with the Liberal Democrats, and with us, Mr Rumbles. Mr Rumbles. Th thank you for giving way. Does the Minister agree that we could, and indeed, as a Parliament, suspend standing orders to allow a committee, whichever one that is the appropriate one to do, to actually look at this at stage two, so that we have a proper process? I, Minister. I entirely accept that that is possible. That is a proposal I'm happy to discuss with the Liberal Democrats, with Labour, in order to get even better scrutiny. I accept that that scrutiny is not perfect. I said so in my introductory remarks. I said so on Tuesday. But we, nothing is set in stone. If we accept this as emergency legislation, we can sit down and have those conversations. And I want to ensure that scrutiny is thorough as possible. And John Lamont has made a very, very telling point as well in terms of the stage one process. And that also needs to be considered in terms of external input. We are in this situation because actually of no fault of our own of the Welsh Government. We've both taken exactly the same position. I am absolutely certain I don't speak for my Labour colleague Mark Drakeford. I'm sure he is also concerned about issues of scrutiny. So we will do everything possible to accommodate those and to be part of those changes. But it is an emergency and it will therefore require a process that is not as intense as we have had in other circumstances. Now let me just deal with some of the areas for consideration on this bill. Uh, Mr. Finlay asked about the 25 areas. I'm happy to uh, discuss with my colleague, Mr. Drakeford, and, and also, uh, I have to say, with the UK government, how we could present those. But certainly, I think that much, as much information as we could possibly give on the process of negotiation should be given. I should, I, I should, I should hope 
that we will be able, during the process of the bill, to address some of the specific issues that Mr Finlay has raised. But, for example, exit day is in it because the UK government could change the exit day. And unless our bill also did so, if it's dealing with uh, devolved powers, then we might be left with a date that we, was inflexible. So our date will go in lockstep, but we have to have the ability to react to the UK government. Uh, clause 11, he asked about Clause 11, and yes, Clause 11 will go. It is redundant. It wouldn't be required and would have to go. Uh, and in terms about the number of statutory instruments, both governments have estimated about 800 to 1,000 statutory instruments. Now, if this, this bill were to come into operation as intended and to work alongside the UK bill, then there would be a division of labour, but it is perfectly possible that we would be able to divide that up equitably and fairly, and we would find ourselves doing no more than we already anticipate doing, of course. Well, a very important point, Minister. Does he expect recess to be cancelled? Minister. But even if we go to the straw bill, we'll have even with the withdrawal bill, with the UK withdrawal bill, we would be in the same situation. I would hope it would not be necessary to cancel Mr Finlay's trips to exotic parts, but you never know. But in the circumstances, I have to point out, fairly presiding officer, that Brexit is a manufacturer, a Tory manufacturer, and therefore the workload that we're talking about this is not brought by me or anybody else, but it will be a workload that we will have to do in any case. We don't anticipate it to be any substantially uh, uh, more uh, weighty than we are already facing. Now, there are a range of other issues that I could address, presiding officer, but these are issues that will be addressed uh, during the process of this bill, and we will find every possible way to address them. Nobody wishes to be in these circumstances. I personally would wish to wind the clock back so that we're not involved in this complete nonsense of a process which is incredibly badly mishandled by the Conservative uh, ministers and the Conservative government. But we are, regrettably, as Ivan McKee has indicated where we are, we have to move forward on it. I hope the Chamber can support this, and I give an absolutely solemn and firm undertaking. I have not only heard, but I have listened to the concerns about scrutiny, and we will work with the other parties to make sure that we address as many of those as we possibly can. Thank you very much, and that concludes our debate, and we're going to move straight to the question, which is that motion 10735, in the name of Michael Russell, to treat the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill as an emergency bill, will we agree to do that? Are we agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. Members will move to division, and you may cast your votes now. The result of the vote on motion 10735 in the name of Michael Russell is yes, 86, no, 27. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. We'll now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of two business motions. Motion 10745 on a timetable for an emergency bill. Sorry, point of order, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Before the consideration of the business motion on timetabling, uh, I wonder if I could ask uh, your guidance uh, on its implication. Uh, I'm under the impression uh, that some of my colleagues certainly have told me that uh, committee clerks may be under the impression that, that deadlines for amendments may precede the debates. So the stage two deadline might precede the stage one debate. Now, I, I know that privately in, in meetings of the Bureau, uh, you've told us that that will not be the case. If members, Order, please. If members will allow this, I know that you've uh, given a, uh, a general guidance to, to the Bureau that that will not be the case. I think it would be very helpful, even if we can't be specific about the amendment deadlines today, to give a general public uh, advice, uh, including to all of our subject committees and their members, that amendment deadlines will take place after the debate for each preceding stage so that members are in a position to prepare any proposals for amendments. 
Can I thank Mr Harvey for his point of order, and it does indeed give me an opportunity to make the whole Chamber aware of an issue that was discussed in the last meeting of the Bureau. The rules on emergency bill procedures allow me as presenting officer to make a determination on the, amend on the deadlines for amendments at stages two and three, uh, and I will make any such determination uh, having consulted with uh, business managers on the Parliamentary Bureau, and I hope that reassures the member. Point of order, Joanne Lamott. There were very helpful reassurances about reconsideration of the capacity of the Parliament to scrutinise. I would want reassurance that while supporting this proposal here, it does not preclude the, the Bureau listening and acting on the, the reservations that were expressed across the Chamber, but what that timetable actually means. I can I thank the uh, member for the point of order? We are about, we haven't done so yet, but we are about to move two motions which do set out the timetable for this emergency bill procedure. Uh, it would be, and these have been discussed already at the Parliamentary Bureau, it's up for Parliament to decide whether or not to agree to these, this timetable. Even if we agree to this timetable, it would be very much up to the Parliamentary Bureau, for example, to discuss this matter once more and for the Parliament to rearrange the timetable. So we are agreeing it would be up to the Parliamentary Bureau to bring back an alternative if that's what you wish to do so, if you wish to do so. Any other points of order? Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of motion 10745 on a timetable for an emergency bill and motion 10764 on a revised business programme. Could I ask any member who wishes to speak against those motions or either motion to press their request to speak button now? And could I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motions? Formally moved. Thank you, Mr Fitzpatrick. Could I call Morris Golden? Uh, thank you, President Officer. I have no wish to rehash uh, the debate which we have just had regarding the Continuity Bill and its status as an emergency bill. So specifically on timetabling, which these motions refer to, and respecting the will of this Parliament as well as the default position, which is far from desirable. We believe that even as emergency legislation, there needs to be an increase in parliamentary scrutiny, which this timetabling does not allow. Yeah. Given this is a highly significant piece of wide-ranging legislation, we believe that full parliamentary scrutiny, including full involvement of committees, is required. I would urge this parliament to consider a proper process for consideration of this legislation and reject the timetabling as set out in the two business motions. And can I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to respond? To the Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Minister um, stated during the debate, if the continuity bill is to achieve its purpose of defending the interests and powers of this Parliament, an emergency timetable will be required to ensure that it can be in place prior to the final passage of the withdrawal bill. Indeed, the interim report of the Finance and Constitution Committee unanimously agreed uh, by its members recognised that very point. The interim report accepted that in the event of the government is unable to recommend the consent to the EU withdrawal bill and a continuity bill is introduced, there would be a need for a timetable which would maximise the scope and time available for scrutiny. That is what this business motion proposes today. Presiding officer, yes. Joanne Lamond. I'm sure that the, the minister understands the, grave, the gravity of the points that were made around scrutiny. I am concerned that you seem to be reiterating a point that was made before this debate about the timetable. I would seek reassurance that this timetable is something that you work to, but that you're more than happy to look again at the, actual, the detail of how that scrutiny is carried forward. Yes, yes. yes. To, just to confirm that, I've con confirmed to uh, at least two of the other business managers that that would be my intention, would be to work with them to make sure that the points that Joanne Lamont and, and others made in the Chamber today can, can, be, can be taken into account. Clearly, that will be a, a decision for the, for, for the full, full Bureau. Presiding officer, the Parliament have now agreed to, the, to treat this bill as an emergency bill. If the phase timetable set out in the business motion is not agreed, the default position in the standing orders is that all three stages of the bill will be taken in one day. This would not fulfil the recommendations of the committee's report and it would fail to give Parliament a, <coughs> excuse me, appropriate time to consider this important bill. Whilst the timetable for timetable the government is seeking is challenging, it recognises that it is both appropriate and right that the Parliament should be able to consider its full 
it fully and the maximum time available to allow the continuity bill to pass before the EU withdrawal bill becomes law and obviously taking into account the, the points that have previously been made we need to look at how we can do that to make sure committees and, and others can uh, input into that process. This timetable is not of our choosing rather it is a consequence of the exceptional circumstances we find ourselves in. I therefore ask Parliament to support the proposals to ensure that the continuity bill can be appropriately scrutinised and I urge Parliament to agree the motions. So the question is that motion 10745, the first question is that motion 10745 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 10745 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is yes, 86, no, 27. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. The question is, the final question I should say, is that motion 10764 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 10764 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is yes, 86, no, 27. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And that concludes our business today. I now close this meeting. <laughs>